Good morning, Amsterdam. Good morning, KubeCon. I hope you are energetic today after the keynote sessions. And uh, today we are one of the first sessions and we are starting as a panel discussion. And as you might assume, the panel is uh, something what should be interactive. And we as a panelists on this session, we are expecting what audience is asking questions. So as soon as you have questions, you want to ask something, please raise your hand and our uh, helper in the room will bring you a microphone. Feel free to ask anything uh, in the area. And today we got panelists, uh, many of us from different companies working on different areas. Um, a lot of new topics, a lot of new changes in the past year in the, in the area. So let me first introduce myself and when all my colleagues here on the stage. I am Alexander Kanievsky. I work for Intel. I am part of a team who is working on resource management topics mostly, so runtime, kubelet, and related projects like node feature discovery. Hi, everyone. I am Swati Sehgal. I am working as a principal software engineer in the ecosystem engineering group at Red Hat. I've been involved in the resource management space as well for a while, just like Sasha. And my focus has been NUMA awareness and resource management capabilities, especially the Kubelet resource managers. And uh, looking forward to having questions from you guys. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Ivan Lazar. I'm with NVIDIA, a part of the Cloud Native group, group there. Uh, well, I just try to get GPUs and other funky devices to work in containerized environments. So uh, that's why I'm here. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is David Porter. I'm from the Google Kubernetes Engine team. Uh, I work on Node. I also work in upstream SigNode community. I'm the maintainer of uh, SeaAdvisor, which does resource management monitoring, and I focus a lot in the resource management space. So I'm really excited for this panel. Hey, folks. I'm Sasha. I'm considering myself as an upstream contributor to Kubernetes, so I'm working in SigNode and also SigRelease. Um, I'm also one of the maintainers of Cryo, the container runtime. You may know it. And I really enjoy, uh, I really have hope that you enjoy this KubeCon. It's great to see all of you. All right, to, to start the discussion, uh, the big picture. Uh, the features what in, in the area are present in Kubernetes for quite some years. So we all know the distribution of the functionality between the control plane, like the scheduler pickups the node and keeps track of the resources on the nodes. And when we have Kubelet, uh, this set of the managers who are doing the decision on the node level, plus we have runtimes and different flavors of runtimes, like everyone knows the container project, cryo project, and low level components like uh, run C, C run, kata, and so on. So, something what was known and existing for years. And recently it was some, some of the good improvements were, and I would ask Swati to cover those. Sure. So uh, as just Sasha just mentioned that we've, we have some of these components. Um, in Kubelet, we have a bunch of resource managers, CPU manager, device manager, memory manager, and topology manager. These are components that have been existing for a while, essentially to allocate exclusive CPU, allocate memory exclusively for aligning resources, device assignment, and they've been existing for a while. The goal has, the, recently um, there, was, uh, there was, in the committee it was mentioned that we should avoid perma beta features. So we started uh, an effort to graduate some of these capabilities to GA, and in the past couple of releases, we graduated CPU manager, device manager, as well as topology manager to GA. So if you want more information on these components, I'd recommend you check out some of our blog posts. We have uh, two blog posts on CPU manager and device manager, as well as one on topology manager that talks about uh, its internal details. Next slide. So as Sasha just mentioned, the world has been with, with some of these components for a while, but recently there have been a bunch of additions. We've seen DRA, which is dynamic resource allocation, uh, that was introduced in Kubernetes 126. And then we have topology-aware scheduling. 
Um, this was a feature that was introduced to enable topology-aware aware scheduling in Kubernetes because there's a disconnect between how Kubelet handles resource allocation and the, how default scheduler views components and resources. Uh, in order to do that, we had introduced an API called NRT API, and that allows us to enable topology-aware scheduling. In addition to that, uh, as we interacted with the community, we realized that there are other use cases, and we came across NRI plugins that are using NRT API that was previously introduced for topology-aware scheduling. And then we, we made additional changes to NFD as well to enable topology-aware scheduling. So I think the world is changing, um, and we are co constantly evolving based on the feedback that we're getting from the community, as well as the use cases that we have from our customers and partners. Next slide. So I'll pass it on to Evan. Uh, yeah, so as I said, my, my thing is getting devices, funky devices to work in, in containerized environments. And one of the features that we're quite excited about is dynamic resource allocation. And that goes from a model where you have just integer countable sort of resources like NVIDIA GPUs in this case, trying to plug our products a little bit, um, to, to something that's a bit more expressive. Now, uh, obviously, it's a lot more verbose, but uh, you, you, we introduced this concept of a resource claim, which is associated with a resource class that's defined by a cluster admin or whatever. And it allows users to third-party developers to actually um, expose resources and define an API that suits those types of resources. So uh, my colleague from NVIDIA, Kevin Clues, and uh, Alexei will be presenting a little bit of a deeper dive on DRA in room G104 uh, just after this session. So if anyone's interested, please go check that out. I think it's about a five minute dash if, if you want to. Um, maybe the next slide there. So as we said, it's more verbose, but um, like, why would we do that? Like, what, integer, isn't the integer uh, sort of use case enough? And um, it's not, right? Like uh, these, these devices have developed and, and become more complex and how a user is expecting to interact with them has also become more complex. So um, the fact that we're now exposing a more rich API allows us to do a lot, lot more interesting things with them. Um, so on the slide you see that you know, currently you're able to assign uh, one container, a, a device to one container and there's sort of no sharing. Uh, I know people in the community and ourselves have like weird workarounds and, and hacks in place. Um, but with DRA, you're able to actually, uh, you know, define, you're allowed to sh able to share uh, GPUs or devices across different containers in the same pod, uh, across different pods uh, as well. And you're also able to handle devices that require some kind of parameters to set up. Uh, so you're able to dynamically partition uh, devices and share them and, and sort of mix and match as you choose. Um, so yeah, it, and what this actually uses be behind the scenes is something called the Container Device Interface, or CDI. Uh, as a as a common spec uh, CNCF funded funded uh, project that's a spec that defines how devices or resources actually look from a um, well uh, this DRA node plugin perspective all the way down to the runtimes such as container D and cryo and so I think I'll hand over to to Sasha since uh, he's uh, oh okay uh, he he wants to stand up uh, uh, sitting makes me nervous too yeah, I'm gonna make that a little bit is, is this microphone on? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So giving this a bit more dynamic approach, right? So. All right. So I would like to uh, jump over the slide if, if that's sure. totally possible. So just want to head directly to the slide. So if you look at container um, at features in Kubernetes, then we mostly see them from the perspective of the node or the kubelet. But we uh, also can drive features in, uh, in Kubernetes from the container runtime perspective. So. For example, if we speak about um, our recent enhancements to open telemetry tracing, which enable us to get, uh, collect the, the logs together with metrics and correlate them together and to find out what is wrong on a node, how the resource usage actually is, then uh, having this feature only on the container runtime side, like in cryo, then this wouldn't bring us much at all. I mean, we are working on uh, bringing and more enhanced open telemetry tracing, but we also need it on the kubelet, uh, kubelet side, for example. And for that, we have a dedicated enhancement in upstream Kubernetes where we are working on. So in 127, we enhanced the, created the open telemetry kubelet tracing to uh, beta. So we enhanced the spans. We now have uh, more information about the pod life cycle and uh, about garbage collectors in the kubelet. 
And all of this information bundled together on a single node helps us to understand how resource usage, uh, usage gets applied on a node. The same applies uh, to features, for example, like the event at black. So the pod lifecycle event generator is usually the, the source of truth when it comes to a synchronizing state between workloads and their actually container. And this feature doesn't uh, bring us anything at all if we don't take the container runtime into account. So we have to add sub dedicated support for the event at black and the container runtime. We also have to extend the container runtime interface for that. And this is the end-to-end -end delivery we need in, in the whole cluster setup for each node to let the feature actually work as intended. I would also like to uh, some somehow related features are username spaces, for example, and also swap support. So we kind of plan to uh, continue our work on swap in upstream Kubernetes so that we can have dedicated swap support for the kubelet as well. Um, and there are also some, some features which are more dedicated to the container runtime then. So for example, we have support for the NI in Cryo 127. We have some experimental SecCom notifier support. So uh, SecCom, so this calls have influence on resources on the node, as we already know. And we can then f try out a SecCom notifier to get informed about uh, negative impacts of sys calls on a single node. Um, we also feature now vertical pod auto scaling. But that's just, uh, that's just cryo. And we also have container D, which kind of also drives features in a different direction as well. So maybe, David, can you tell us a bit more about the new stuff in container D? Yeah, sure. So container D 1.7 was just released. And uh, there's a whole bunch of new features in, in container D 1.7. There's a new sandbox API uh, to better manage kind of containers as a unit. Um, there's also some additional features around transfer service. Um, and one of the big new things as well in cross kind of the container ecosystem is NRI, which we'll talk about in a second as well. Yeah, so NRI, well, one of the uh, new acronyms, the three letters ones. It stands for Node Resource Interface. It's new common plugin interface for the runtimes, both implemented in Container D 1.7 and Cryo 1.26. It started as a project, as a, well, sub project of Container D, but over the last year it was evolved as a cross uh, runtime interface to, to plug your custom uh, logic into your cluster. So the key thing about NRI is what uh, the plugins, what you have, it ha we have all the internal knowledge of your container from the runtime. And some of those properties you can adjust on the fly. So like resource limits, the CPU, memory pinging, the swapness, couple of other flags which provides you a lot more flexibility out with out of three components uh, compared to what you can do nowadays with uh, Kublet or with current functionality in tree. So uh, if you want to have uh, a bit more details about NRI, I recommend to watch the presentation what my colleague did in Detroit last autumn. Uh, the protocol description uh, is present in container DNRI repository. And example of the plugins, which implements several resource policies, uh, were published a couple of weeks ago into a common container D tools, uh, sorry, container pro uh, tools project, like alongside with Podman, Conman, and a few other things. So this thing is one of the building blocks which can integrate between uh, multiple features. So like as Swati mentioned, like we have scheduler extension, we have runtime, we have kubelet, we have dynamic resource allocations. Uh, all of these uh, components we, where you can plug your custom logic either for vendor, for the hardware vendor, or as a like cloud service provider, or as a user who optimize some of the things. And obviously there is a need of sharing the information between those components. And piece or, or like set of data how to share with that is uh, another three letter acronym what Swati already mentioned is called Node Resource Topology API. So we have Node Resource Topology API. This is an API that is CRD based and it was introduced to enable topology awareness in Kubernetes. Um, for to enable this solution we had to 
enable it as an out of tree component. We have two components as part of this. One is a component that exposes hardware topology and the other component that utilizes it, which is the scheduler plugin, which uses this information and makes topology aware scheduling decision. So the API itself was designed to have more granular information um, of the resources. So you, in, in terms of topology aware scheduling, we have we can have it distributed across NUMA and we have information on how much resource is available, allocatable, and what is the capacity. As we started engaging more in the community, we realized that topology aware scheduling is not the only use case and NRI plugins can use it as well. So that's when uh, Sasha and other folks in the community interacted and provided us feedback on additional things that we can do, you know, introducing top level attributes as opposed to specific field for topology manager policies, which can be used uh, for other capabilities as well. So uh, I have the link here on slides for the API, and I've also plugged in um, a talk that I'm going to have later today on topology aware scheduling if you're interested to learn more about it. So one, one more thing which was also happening uh, in the last year uh, and continues in this year, quite, quite interesting and active discussion, is support for C groups version two. Uh, it was graduated to J recently, uh, and it enables a lot of new functionality. And I would like ask to David to cover it. Yeah. So, to kind of step back for a second, you know, whether you're using devices, whether you're not, every single uh, container out there is probably using CPU and memory, which are the core kind of Kubernetes resources, right? And so. Underpinning pods and container resources uh, with CPU and memory are C groups. So C groups are the Linux kernel feature that provides kind of a couple things. One is being able to kind of group a, pro group a set of processes together and be able to limit the resource usage. So be able to limit how much CPU and memory those resources have able to. So uh, C group v1 was kind of the first iteration of the C group API and what's what everybody was using. And so very recently in the ecosystem, C group v2. Uh, has been starting out, and we're really happy to announce it was G8 in Kubernetes 125. So Seagrove V2 is a new kind of platform, and so it has many new resource management capabilities that we're kind of hoping to take advantage in Kubernetes to provide more enhanced resource management capabilities. So some of the example I want to highlight kind of the few projects that we're working on in the Signode community that are kind of built on top of the Seagrove V2 platform. One of them is Memory QoS. This is alpha in Kubernetes 127. So this basically provides memory uh, guarantees for pods. So you know, before, you didn't actually have guarantees around the minimum amount of memory your application can have. With memory QoS, we actually provide minimum guarantees, so your pod will always have this amount of memory, and also we can kind of prevent uh, or and help prevent ooms and other kind of out-of-memory situations. Some of the other things we're looking into is PSI metrics. So PSI metrics is a new Cgroup v2 feature that basically provides uh, metrics around resource shortages. So you can see things like, hey, there's CPU pressure, memory pressure, and the kernel will provide us metrics about that. We're hoping to take advantage of these metrics in Kubelet and be able to make more informed, smart decisions around, for example, which pods to evict or how to prioritize different pods when they access different resources. And then kind of the longer term roadmap is, you know, we have pretty good support today for CPU and memory, but that's not the only resources that pods and containers use. Some of the other things we're thinking about is I.O. isolation. We want to make sure that if multiple pods are competing and trying to use the shared I.O. resources on a node, we can provide some guarantees around that. Um, as Sasha mentioned, swap is something that we're looking into. Uh, swap is already alpha, and there's more work to be done there. But many applications, for example, need to uh, allocate large, large amounts of memory and you know, can't all fit in, uh, fit in main RAM, so we need swap for that. And then there's other resources as well that we haven't really explored too much around isolation, but there's more and more use cases around, for example, network. How do we guarantee the different pods will be able to access the network and be able to provide kind of QS guarantees? So in general, we're really excited to hear from you. What type of kind of resource management challenges are you having, and what features are you kind of looking forward to, and what issues do you have? Uh, I did a talk actually in last KubeCon. Seagrove V2 is coming soon to a cluster near you in Detroit uh, that provides some more details around kind of the Seagrove V2 platform. And so if you're curious, that's a good resource to check out. 
Uh, so with that, I think uh, we want to kind of open it up for questions. We'd love to understand kind of what resource management issues you have, how, what you think about these features, what use cases you have, and kind of we'd love to hear from you. What is, what is the question here? Can I, can I switch on the microphone? <laughs> well, Hello? Yes, excellent. Um, so first question is about these dynamic allocation of resources. Does this also allow me to like on the fly dynamically allocate a GPU on a node? Because from what I understand right now, if I want a container that have access to a GPU, I need to actually allocate a node type that has GPU attached all the time. Um, I mean, it might not even make sense to do. I'm not that familiar with all these things. So um, you're saying that you so the GPU, well, in order to access a GPU, one is a GPU present, right? So I suppose it depends on your infrastructure there. Okay. Um, and so DRA in, in general uh, allows you, if there is a way to do it, it allows you to define the API so that users can access it. Okay. Um, Kevin over here uh, might have more context, uh, and he might be able to give you some more information there. Yeah, I think what you might be asking is that today, if you if you... If you want to access a GPU on a node and you want to access a specific type of GPU, you um, can only put a, one type of GPU on any individual node in your cluster, and you have to use node selectors to direct your pod to a node that has that GPU type on it. And with DRA, we'll be able to um, have a mix and match of GPUs on a specific node because the API that we are now defining to access GPUs using DRA will allow you to select on a specific GPU type, a certain amount of memory you might want to have access to, independent of the GPU type, and so on. So what DRA really gives you is the flexibility to define whatever API you want for the resources that your DRA driver is advertising um, um, to, for you to be able to, to, to allocate. And um, we are defining that API for our GPUs so that you have a, l a lot more flexibility in how you can request access to them. And the way that I've been talking about it, at least internally in NVIDIA, is that with the capabilities we're adding to our DRA resource driver for GPUs, you're basically going to have a similar user experience for being able to get access to a GPU and run a workload on it now inside Kubernetes that you would have if you were um, running on a bare metal machine and just wanted to launch a CUDA job. You can have the same kind of user experience in, in that way. Yep. Yes, no? Any other questions? Hi. Uh, will the PCI metrics include something for identifying uh, CPU contention uh, from the pod side? Because we're trying to pack more workloads to the nodes, and uh, we, we think we found out it's very hard to know when there's CPU contention, especially like for short bursts that wouldn't show up in uh, CPU usage on the node level. Yeah, so I think that's a great question, and I think more and more folks are, you know, we're cost conscious trying to bin pack their, their nodes as much as possible, and so being able to monitor those resources is really critical. Like, we have a few things in, in, in the pipeline, so one of them is what I mentioned earlier, the PSI metrics. We hope those will be able to be exposed and will be able to kind of provide more fine-grained, kind of up-to-date, um, uh, metrics around uh, CPU contention. Um, I also want to plug kind of, uh, there's essentially a session later today uh, I'm doing with my colleague Peter. Uh, we're actually going to be talking specifically around uh, pod and container workload metrics and some of the work we're doing in this space. And we hope to kind of cover some of those areas there. So 
Thank you. Uh, hey, what's the name of the talk? Ah, it's right there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no. I would also like to add two wet questions. So detection of a contention or resource jamming is one piece of a, of a puzzle. But the second piece is you need to change somehow or like affect the running containers, like squeeze them or like regroup them or pin it to, to some other places. And this is where the piece like NRI can help you. So you can plug your dynamic policy, which based on detection settings, tweak where existing running containers like in transparent mode. And, and one other thing I wanted to add there, one other feature that we're really excited about that we had been mentioned in 127 is dynamically updating resources on containers. So today you can, this is a new feature that's alpha, you can update how much CPU memory your application requests without actually re recreating your pod. So we hope kind of long term we can integrate some of these new monitoring kind of intelligence around re uh, detecting these resource shortages and then actually being able to update the resource requirements there. And in addition to that, it's, it's the more like the broader topic about how to make the whole uh, resource management and kubelators more dynamic. So right now is the resources are detected once the kubelet starts and that's considered to be static. And the world has changed it. So the devices can be hot plugged. Uh, well, something goes offline, something goes online. Uh, it, it might be like new resources popping up. So we, we have a lot of areas in the, in the stack where we can improve. It's, it comes to like everywhere, like the kubelet, like the C advisor part, where discovery, where like dynamic uh, status update of, of a node, when the CRI protocol, like how the things are communicated, like, like when one of the common examples was the misconfiguration of C group driver between the kubelet and runtime. So now with Docker Shim is gone, we have a lot of flexibility of how to improve the communications between the kubelet and runtimes and how to make it more flexible, more dynamic, more advanced. Like network stuff, pod level events, a lot of other things. So even internally in Kubelet, we are noticing that there's the desire for flexibility. Um, CPU manager, for example, has two policies. One is none and static. And there was this initiative. We wanted to modify the existing CPU manager static policy. And in order, for, in order to do that, rather than introducing a new policy, we introduced a construct called CP Manager Policy Option to add, add additional policy options to change the behavior of static policy. So we have a PCPU policy, we have uh, aligned by socket policy, and many others. So this, this clearly shows that there's a desire for flexibility. And on the similar way, we have in Topology Manager, Topology Manager Policy Options, where we want to uh, modify the behavior, how, how alignment happens. In scenarios where it's not possible to align C CPUs or resources in general from a single NUMA node, we want to minimize the number of NUMA nodes from which they can be allocated. And, and just like Sasha mentioned, there's a desire to actually move in the direction that we have additional flexibility in resource management capabilities with external components. So similar to device plugins and DRA, we can, uh, we can have a mechanism to introduce more uh, fancy ways of representing resources, be it uh, CPUs, devices, and memory in general. Any other questions? Hi, um, my question is uh, mostly related to running real-time applications on uh, Kubernetes and... Uh, Can you speak closer a bit to the microphone? Yeah, so uh, my questions are uh, mostly related to running real-time applications uh, on Kubernetes. So uh, uh, we, we have two specific use cases, like uh, uh, we would want to partition the cache uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for real-time uh, pods. And uh, the second question is... Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Linux has the uh, concept of isolated and non-isolated CPUs. Uh, 
so can we uh, use NRM to solve these two uh, cases? Uh, short answer, yes. There are some capabilities already existing in the upstream components. So, for example, for, for the cache uh, and actually initial implementation for block I.O. separation, uh, the feature was implemented in container runtime, I think, in container D1.7. And for Cryo, I think it was in 1.25. Uh, it's controlled by annotations, so you can specify like which workload belongs to which partition of the cache or which partition of uh, uh, block I.O. Uh, priorities. Uh, there is currently the cap under discussion. It's called QoS class resources. So uh, this thing will provide you a kind of like first class citizen uh, functionality in the pod spec. So for each container, you can define the class uh, when it will be, uh, it, it, this cap also includes the dynamic discovery of this class-based resources. So like something like, 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 why, uh, um, like cache or something like classifiable uh, resources can be discovered on the cluster. Uh, it has functionality about the quotas, so you can define what, like, which namespace or which containers can able to use particular class. So, for example, like, uh, like low priority applications are not being able to use uh, like uh, higher class range and and so on. So, work work is going on. Some of the features you can use already now. Some of the features are coming. A yeah. uh, follow-up question is, uh, uh, would it be possible to even uh, create dynamic uh, class, uh, QoS classes? Uh, yes. We, we, we kept what I mentioned with QoS class resources. It's built on top of the idea of it's dynamically discovered and discover, uh, like dynamically provisioned on the cluster. So it's not hard-coded values, not like current uh, like native resources. So it's not, not like CPU memory huge pages you will get a flexibility so like your cluster your rules it will be a mechanism to plug you in uh, to discover your classes and you will have a control what those classes means like would it be cache block io or any other things what you might fit into this uh, like philosophy of resources okay and uh, regarding the second question uh, so uh, uh, the cpu resources could be isolated and non isolated so are, are there some policies with which we can uh, specifically uh, select uh, uh, whether I, I want an isolated CPU or a non-isolated CPU? So uh, with current upstream topology manager plus CPU manager, you can get the exclusive CPU cores for uh, guaranteed QoS resource, uh, guaranteed QoS pod classes. Uh, yeah, with, but with, with NRI plugins nowadays, you can get more flexible thing for like is isolated CPUs based on our properties of our workloads. Okay, so uh, wait, so, wait. so the Kubelet doesn't uh, look at uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, kernel settings. It doesn't look at uh, and identify whether a CPU is isolated or non-isolated. So uh, I mean, how do we? Uh, how can I specify that I need an isolated CPU on the system and not a non-isolated CPU? So based on the quality of service of your pod, you can determine if the, if the uh, pod is allocated exclusive CPU. So if your pod was um, guaranteed, means request is equal to limit. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I understand that part. Guaranteed and uh, best effort are, are already available. Yeah. But uh, at the kernel level, you have uh, a property saying the CPU is isolated. That means nothing right. runs. Yeah, on, I think. On those yeah, cores. at this point in time, there's no support for isolated CPUs in Kubernetes. You'd have to manually manage it yourself to separate those CPUs from that particular pool. And yeah, uh, yeah, but it can be allocated to your uh, yeah. your system. But how do we get get that uh, um, uh, uh, visible in in the Kubernetes resources? In you don't need to make it visible into Kubernetes. So Kubelet is not going to support the isolated CPUs. Okay. But the different plugin mechanism, what we mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, it it provides you flexibility to do it. Okay. So. Like one of, one of the links what I was showing on the slides, uh, the plugin, uh, it has a support for detecting isolated CPU and giving it to the container when it's requested. Thank you. So, 
If you would like to come to me after the session, I will show more direct examples. Sure, thanks. I, I think we have like, yeah, one, one minute. We can take one more question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so about uh, the tracing integration, what kind of configuration is needed for integrating uh, those additional traces from nodes with OpenTelemetry, for example? And is it possible to associate them with anything that application is doing with uh, traces from applications? That's probably. Thanks. So right now, the focus was more on implementing or getting more information from the kubelet and the container runtime and, and correlating together, so passing the trace spans over the container runtime interface and also integrating more traces into uh, libraries we already use in Kubernetes, like Klog and stuff like that. Um, but later on, we would like to get more information uh, on the actual workload. Yeah, But that's for future, for future plans. Thanks. All right, we run out of time. So thank you very much for coming to our sessions. We will be available uh, either in conference halls or in corresponding booths of our companies. So if you have questions, please visit our, our talks uh, or catch, it, catch us up. We will be happy to talk on, on all of those areas. Thank you. <laughs>